All right now on Tennis Channel Inside In, uh, always a blast to be talking with this person. Uh, there's only been 28 ATP World number one. 17 of them have been lucky enough to finish, uh, fortunate enough to finish year end number one. Uh, this guy is one of them. Uh, he dreamed of being a Reds baseball player, but settled for being a Hall of Famer in another sport. Uh, Jim Courier, thanks for joining the hey, show. It's great to be with you. Inside <laughs> In kind of works for me. I was much better at the inside out, but you know, I'll, I'll make do today. Yeah. Hey, you know what? You're, you're a jack of all trades and uh, the broadcasting, you know, a titan in the industry. I'll say it, one of the standards and some of the people that, you know, we look towards this year in particular has been just a fascinating tennis season. I know we're, we're in it and we're, we're going to love it regardless, but 2022 might go down as one of the most you know, dramatic in terms of all the different types of storylines. I really think the record books are going to reflect that too. Yeah, there's no doubt. I hard agree on that. You start with the, the political drama in Australia, which was unprecedented in, in this era. Of course, we've had politics intervene uh, with South African players in the past, going back to obviously the beginning of the professional circuit. There were a lot of politics involved there, a lot of, a lot of movement, but bringing the government in and having... Mm -hmm. Uh, someone who is uh, so important in the Australian Open's history get <laughs> deported and detained. It was just, uh, it was incredible news down there. It was global news. Um, then you move forward from that, and you, you have the these magical finals, the Australian Open. Ash Barty wins, first time a local had won in a while. Nadal gets to 21 on the back of Djokovic being deported. And then Barty retires, and it all just sort of cascaded from there. It was just a lot of drama. I mean, we can go on and on about yeah. what has um, transpired this season. And there's just been so many touch points that are seared into the tennis fan's brain. There's no better reality show than live sports. And the also exactly. fact is Barty winning and retiring. That feels like five years ago. Right. You know, it's Doesn't like it? the Djokovic drama that was in the same calendar year. It's crazy. We get to these ATP finals. It's the end of a long year. We know how the, the schedule can be arduous. And, you know, it's funny. I looked up your 92. You played 87 matches that year. That's a lot. It was, that's, it's a lot of tennis. And I know that there's fatigue. There's, you know, reasons to kind of have concern going into this. Like, how are we going to finish strong? Some players don't make the final, uh, don't decide to play in it. I think there's a lot to be taken away from just setting yourself up for the next year, Jim. And as you know, playing somebody that you're going to see down the road in finals like this is more you know Sitsipas Medvedev are playing later today these are guys that are going to see each other and just getting a win getting an edge on a player like that mm -hmm. has to hold weight yeah there's no doubt I mean, this is uh this is an important time of the year in general the players you you'd ideally at least my recollection is you wanted to finish the year on a high so you felt good going into your off season you could go get a break for a little bit and then come back yeah. refreshed and eager ready to get prepared for what is typically a very physical situation in Australia, given that the heat conditions that pop yeah. up inevitably and you want to get off on the good foot, you know, you come shooting out of the Canyon uh, out of a cannon in, in the season, you don't have a lot of time to get ready for the first major. So you want to kind of build towards your off season, if that yeah. makes sense. So yeah. um, we'll see how things play out here in the ATP finals as it goes, but it's um, it, there's a lot at stake. There are a lot of ranking points that are valuable at stake and uh, that's a big tournament to win. I was just so struck by the visual the the ATP finals had all eight of the players sitting in a circle. We talk about how long the year is. It goes by fast. Djokovic and Nadal are the elder statesmen now. It was them and a bunch of, I don't want to say kids, but young players. And it was just an interesting visual to see those two guys as the last of that era in this group. They're the last standing at this point uh, at yeah. that level. Murray, yeah. obviously, yeah. is hampered physically. I wish he could, he could move the way he mm -hmm. once could because he'd probably still be a part of it if that were the case. Mm -hmm. But those guys, their, their longevity is is outstanding. Obviously, Federer is missed, but he gave so much. Yeah. And then you have this young group of players that are really filling that vacuum, and they're doing it really inter in interesting ways and really well. And uh, I, I love where men's tennis is at the moment. I think we're in a really interesting inflection point with, with the Lions in winter yeah. kind of holding on as much <laughs> as they can, but the, the youngster is ready to grab it. So a lot of storylines within these finals. Uh, I don't want to be a complete alarmist, but with Nadal, four-match losing streak for the first time since 2009, players that he's haven't, he hasn't really had trouble with have beaten him. Uh, and we know there's a lot to, to go into this. The body's been beaten down. He's a new father. There's new roles there. He's never really had success indoor hard end of the year. What do you make of, I guess, the lack of success he's had? And is there anything you see with his game that's off based on his elite level? You laid out all the conditions. Mm -hmm. So when you factor all of that in, 
it's not that surprising that he's struggling. He, one other factor is how quick the court is mm. this year, too. It's quicker than it was last year. Low bouncing has always bothered him. Yeah. But the, the speed of the of the surface is also more challenging for him. He's made some mistakes that we're, we're not used to seeing, yeah. which you can attribute to the court. He's missed some very makeable volleys, stumbled coming into on a serve and volley the other day. So he's just a little out of sync. And confidence is king. Andy Roddick, I think, has put it better than anyone. Experience is overrated. Confidence is mm. underrated. And right now, Rafa is just low on confidence. And he needs desperately a win or two. The good news for him, yeah. though, Mitch... Even if he loses his third round robin match and goes zero and three, yeah. he has more exhibition tennis mm-hmm. ahead in South South America. A lot of it with Casper Ruud, he's going to get some form, you would think, and yeah. play his way in. And I think he's scheduled to play that new United Cup mixed event as yeah. well prior to the Australian Open to get some guaranteed matches. Then, do you put him in a different category? And, and I'm interested your take on this, having lived it. He seems like someone that thrives on just being on the court like it's not so much about the training it's not even I mean he practices so hard but he loves matches and match Mm -hmm. play to him maybe holds more weight than the average pro tennis player yeah look I think that because he has always had a lot of at least be spoken about a lot Mm -hmm. of open doubts Mm -hmm. about his game and having to prove it day in and day out I'm not surprised this is his approach someone like Federer had so much innate belief in his game that he could just turn it on when he came back after a break and not really worry about it and stress about it. But Rafa tends to stress over many, many things in between points. Right. And overall there's a macro stress there too, which, um, you know, I think you see play out when he's on a a little bit of a bad patch right now, he needs something to turn the corner and and that will happen. I'm sure at some point, but it hasn't happened yet this fall. Yeah. I don't want to speculate on anything. And we've seen this happen before. What's wrong with Rafa? And then he just rebounds and wins a couple of slams and wins all the clay court tournaments. But we know health is, is fragile. And Federer is a great example. It was going, was rolling along, rolling along fine. Wimbledon final in 19, 2020 Aussie semi. And then the body broke down and that was pretty much it. So that's what makes me a little worrisome. Listen, we've been lucky to have yeah. Rafa as long as we've had him. And I hope we'll have him for a, a, a much longer time. But uh, my feeling generally is just gratitude that he's been able to endure mm. because his game is so physical. And I was among the leaders of people who didn't think he'd play out of his 20s because mm. of the physicality. And I'm so pleased that he's been able to, that we've been yeah. able to witness his greatness for so long. You had a couple of predictions, right, though. So you might might have missed that one. But the Alcaraz winning a teen slam, yeah. that, was, you know, <laughs> that, one, that was a good one. Some good and some bad there. Uh, yeah. Somebody who's not struggling, Novak Djokovic, is into the semis. Two matches played, 15 games lost. Beat Tsitsipas in two pretty tight sets. The Rublev match this morning as we record this was classic Djokovic in the sense that he wins that first set. How many times you see him just get off to that hot start in the second That's and just right. play downhill? Uh, one of the one of the you know points that I think that's a great you've made before with Rublev is the matchup with him and that second serve being a little weak. He plays an aggressive returner. It can be it can be trouble fast, and we saw that today. How clean Novak played and attacked that second serve. Yeah, once you get behind in a rally on a quick low bouncing court. Um, like Rublev can when he hits a second serve against Novak, it's tough to catch back up. It's tough. It's a tough court to turn defense mm-hmm. into offense. So when Novak has a service day the way he did, where he serves over 80% first serves in play, yeah. and he's hitting his spots, there's not a lot of room for, for Rublev to, to make any mistakes as far as missing first serves. One game where he misses two or three first serves, that's probably a break. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you, I mean, are you as impressed as I am in the sense that it's kind of the underrated part of Djokovic, all the accolades, all the brilliance. He's turned himself into one of the best servers that the tour has. And that, you know, wasn't the case when he first came. That was his weakness. And now he's smart. He's aggressive. It's federal like where he disguises it. And every big point, it seems like he comes up with the goods. Yeah, we witnessed him struggle early in his career with a, a, a different service motion than he has right, right now. He had to adapt a different service motion momentarily when he had the elbow problem. But he's come back to his, his good service motion now. And, and what I'm also really excited about for him and for us as fans is he's starting to hit the kick serve again, which had disappeared after the elbow surgery. So that's another element, another part of his arsenal that he can bring in and get people off of the court and the ad court where he had been largely just hitting more body serves right. and T-slice serves seemingly to protect his elbow. So he seems like he has all of his options again. And 
you know, his 35 year old body is not the average 35 year old body. And, and uh, I, I could easily see him playing for, you know, Tom Brady like years. It's scary to think, but it doesn't look like if he's lost anything, it hasn't been much. And he's adding stuff too. And and did you ever have a, a moment in your career where you had time off where, I mean, he's saying like, this is great. I get to train more. I get to work on new wrinkles to my game. Was that something that you know, you ever experienced and were able to kind of add to? No, I mean, I never had a situation like no. his. I'm, I'm right. think, trying to think of anyone who had, right. you know, where you actually have to take time off and you're not injured. Uh-huh. That's a really unique scenario. Yeah. And uh, I never experienced that. And we played a, a pretty full schedule um, mm-hmm. back in the 90s. We, we tended to play more tournaments than they play yeah. these days and more exhibitions. So it, it seemed like it was, you know, on you're the on, on the wheel all the time. Um, you know, in hindsight, it would have been great to be able to take a – you know, to schedule a little bit more like a Federer showed us how to do, and then Novak has mm-hmm. done when he's been in control of his For schedule, sure. where they they'll take month blocks off and give themselves a chance to hit the reset button. My my generation of players didn't do that. Well, his first ATP Finals in 07, he lost in the first match. In 08, he actually won it. It was the Masters Cup then, but he lost his first match. That's it. Every first match he's won from 09 on. Is it comfort in the surface? Is the round robin format? I mean, I'm sure it's a little bit of everything, but. In your estimation, why is he just so comfortable and dominant in this setting, in this tournament? Well, s- start with his greatness. Yeah. Start with, then you move to the conditions, the lower bouncing court. That that hurts Rafa. It doesn't hurt Novak one bit. He He's very comfortable taking the ball at, you know, waist level or lower, and his game doesn't suffer um, at all. Um the record of winning those first round matches, normally he's been a top three seed, so that means he's playing someone kind of six or six through eight or yeah. something like that. So it's it's a little bit of a of a, a mismatch ranking wise, right. but they're great players. <laughs> These are top yeah. eight players. It's yeah. not like they're they're giveaway matches. So I think it's just a testament to his brilliance more than anything else. He raises his level maybe as good as anyone I've ever seen in my life. And and you can speak to this more, but there are so many times in majors where he gets better as the tournament goes on. It doesn't really make a lot of sense on the outside. Like, how are you getting better against better players? But that's his MO. Yeah, I mean, he does that. I don't know that that is, is something that separates him mm-hmm. from some of the other great players. I think mm-hmm. you look at players like a Serena. They get yeah. a few matches under their belt in a slam, and the confidence grows. They get comfortable with the conditions. I think that's a little bit more static. I think one of the things that makes him so special is the way that he uses the energy around him and not always the positive energy around him to stoke his fire. Right. You know, he is, defiance is such a signature characteristic for him. And anytime mm-hmm. uh, the fans start to get on him, he uses that as fuel for his fire. And he's just such a vicious <laughs> competitor that um, he's, he's tough to, to knock down uh, on any level. Well, happy to see him back in Australia next year. Uh, it's setting up for not just Australia, but I think the year is going to be very good to him. It's where it's looking like, but Agreed. We'll sh- we shall see uh, more with Jim Courier here on tennis channel inside in uh, the rest of the group play. There's a lot of interesting matchups. How about Casper rude winning his group, getting to the semifinals, big wins uh, over Fritz over Felix. And it just, I, I marvel at what he's done with his game. He has turned himself into not just merely good, but a great player. He is playing very efficient tennis. And Jim, when I watch him, I see a baseline game that is just so solid that yeah. players might have better weapons than him, might have better top level game, but his baseline is so good. He's in every match, in every fight. Yeah, he, he's a great athlete. He's a great light mover. So he's quick on his feet to get out of the way and get forehands mm-hmm. as much as uh, just about anybody in the game, right? And he's got a mm-hmm. lethal forehand. I think his backhand has gotten better as well. I think he's getting more depth on that two-hander, and he's able to change directions a little bit more easily down the line, which is really difficult on this yeah. quick court in uh, in Torino, but he's doing it. And one of the things that's really elevated for him in the last two years is his surf. Mm-hmm. The serve speed has climbed on both the first serves and the second serves, and one of the things that we note when we watch him is he also has that element of camouflage in his game with the quick toss. So he catches the ball practically on the rise. So it's hard to get a bead on which way that toss is indicating the serve is going. So he's able to hide that. And then he's got good speed on the ball. It's a pretty, then he's got a big forehand behind it. Yeah. 
you can see why he's a rough customer these days. He's studied. He's admittedly studied Nadal, and you can see like that. It's, yeah. it's clear as day. But I, I just I'm always impressed with people that better themselves, and that he keeps moving the goalposts. He was three years ago outside the top sixty. Then it was this guy's a clay court specialist. Then he makes the Miami final. Then the U.S. Open final. And outside of you know, a handful, he's going to finish top three, maybe even two, depending on how it goes. So this is consistency off the charts, and I'm happy for him and what he means to a region of the country that hasn't had success tennis-wise. It's been a while since the, the Scandic nations <laughs> have seen success. They had so yeah. much in Sweden, right, yeah. in the men's game. Right. So we have Caroline Wozniacki, who had a lot mm-hmm. of success for them as well. But uh, you, you now have Casper, you have Holger Runa, oh, yeah. who's entered the fray as well. So that's going to pique a lot of interest, I, I think, up there in Northern Europe. The rest of the group play kind of just grouping some of these players together. We have some showdowns scheduled. Tomorrow will be Fritz and Felix for a spot in the semis. Great opportunity for both of them. Taylor is just such a nasty competitor, and I mean that you know glowingly. He fights through tooth and nail. Had a terrible break in the six-all point yesterday on the net court, but what a year for him to get to this point, getting the spot. And then for Felix, was kind of hyped deservedly so early, and this has been the year he's put it all together too. So these are two players that are going to carry the mantle forward and the chance is now to make a semi-final of ATP finals it's a golden opportunity it's a big one you're right about that Mitch and Felix is going to be come flying high coming in off of, of that win over Rafa mm-hmm. he played played quite well even though Rafa's not at his best you still got to beat him mm-hmm. and uh, he sure he sure did and Fritz has become one of the great day in day out competitors in yeah. men's tennis he, he just gives no quarter uh, doesn't matter if he's injured, he, he's coming for you, and he loves to fight and compete, and he's honed his game to a place now where he understands clearly if he's got a ball in the strike zone, he's going to go after it. Yeah. And that it, that kind of a threat, that creates errors from the yeah. opponents because they don't want to leave anything in the strike zone. I think it's going to be a fascinating contest. They're both big servers, and uh, they both have you know big weapons on the ground. Who's going to stand and deliver in a big match? We'll that, see. That's such a good point. I've always appreciated that style of play. He's figured out, okay, this is what works. This is the chance to win. If I'm going to go out, I'm going out on my shield. And he's done that. I mean, in the losses he's had this year, some pretty tough ones, he's rebounded nicely. It hasn't gotten him down. You could say the same for Felix after that Australian semi-loss mm-hmm. to Medvedev. But to keep it going and to keep the energy positive is a huge thing. Yeah, there's no doubt. These guys have had fantastic years, but they've had big disappointments mm. and big tournaments. The U.S. Open was tough on those guys. Mm. You know, and, and then Felix just caught a gear, Laver Cup, and yeah. since then he just, he's figured some stuff out and got some swagger and confidence. Win those finals. I mean, he was yeah. always the guy that struggles in finals, and right. the narrative's flipped now. Yeah, I mean, he won the big one in Rotterdam early in the year. That kind of got him going, but then he had a little bit of the dip. Yeah, and then yeah. all of a sudden he wins that you know massive match yeah. at, at Laver Cup, and he against Novak, yeah. and he's off and running. Can we also just point out, and we'll get to Alcaraz in a second too, but how important it is, or it seems to be, to have a stable team around you that it had been building. We could even say this with guys like Tommy Paul and Francis Tiafo, but Fritz, Felix, Alcaraz, having the same voices work to build you up and. I just, that's just my two cents. I know you, you lived it on tour, but I feel like having consistency on your team is a huge thing. I think consistency matters. I, I think calmness matters too. And, and when you look at the, the teams and the voices and the experience that they bring in to all those players you mentioned, you've got a, a steady stream of here's where we're going. It's not about today necessarily. It's about the long term because these are young players that right. are very much in development. And Alcaraz is in the same boat where you have this vision of we are not finished. We are, we're not a finished product. We've got to keep moving forward. And in some ways that de-stresses and depressurizes mm-hmm. the results today when you know you're still working towards tomorrow. we got Medvedev and Tsitsipas today, uh, the winner of this match. We'll see if Medvedev loses. He's, he's out. It becomes an elimination match. But Rublev, Tsitsipas, Medvedev fighting for that final spot. Tsitsipas, who's struggled mightily head-to-head against Medvedev but won the last match. That's the confidence builder I was kind of talking about. If Sitsipas can kind of work on some things he did yeah. in Cincinnati. And I don't think Medvedev's where he wants to be confidence-wise mm-hmm. either. I think he, he struggled a little bit here uh, since really since the groin injury earlier. Mm-hmm. They had the hernia operation earlier this spring. Hasn't quite put it back together where we're used to seeing him be so infallible on hard courts. Yeah. And again, on a quicker, low-bouncing surface for Sitsipas, he'll have to be patiently aggressive, but he's going to have chances to be aggressive. And I'll be curious, Mitch, to see if he deploys some of the similar 
different tactics we saw in mm-hmm. Cincinnati where he served in volleyed Tsitsipas. He drop shot in Medvedev. He didn't allow Daniil to stand deep in the court and just yeah. play defense. He forced him forward and in, in uh, out of his comfort zone, and that worked well for him. We'll see if uh, if he can put that together today. Mentally, I I just I hope he's locked in the whole match. I hope he fights because the Cincinnati semi was great. The final, not so much against yeah. Chorich. Uh, but Medvedev too. I mean, talk about creatures of habit. He loves playing tennis. Not being able to play with the injury as a large part of that important. So Rublev still circling. Sitsipas Medvedev. It's great. Uh, and also want to mention role number one. It was clinched with Nadal's loss and Roots win. It's going to be Carlos Alcaraz, the youngest ATP world number one year end of all time. Remarkable stuff. And I, and I mentioned that you had called that you think this guy's going to be, you know, a, a number one, a slam winner as a teen and the first since Rafa to do it. What did you see early on? I mean, I know he's grown leaps and bounds, but what was it about your first prognosis of his game that really got you hooked? Well, it really came into to real vision during the Indian Wells Miami swing this year. That's when his game took a big leap forward. And, and we put it under a microscope on Tennis Channel. We covered all of his matches practically and we couldn't find weakness. Mm. You know, the only weakness was a lack of experience and possibly shot selection, maybe an overuse of drop shots on pressure points that was starting to become predictable. But you could see that the guy had some of the best wheels in the sport. <laughs> he did not lack for power anywhere, including serve for guys six feet tall, which is below tour average from a height standpoint. Hard to hit serves with that much power and get him in all the time. He hits at 135 if mm. he wants to. So you, you look at... Well, how do you attack? What are What's a strategy against an Alcaraz? And you realize it's going to require something special because he can beat you on defense and on offense. Yeah. And those are the qualities that, that the big four, especially the big three, have been bringing to the table with so much success for so long. And now he had it earlier than any of those guys did. The way he won that U.S. Open and got the number one ranking also stood out to me. It wasn't just a coronation. It wasn't just breezing through the draw and things opening up. He went five sets, three in a row, and then four in the final. So to fight to do it, I think, actually is going to hold more weight. He knows he's battle-tested. Yeah, how about the late nights, early mornings? He was finishing at like 2.30 in the morning, which means you're not getting to bed probably till 5 or 6. That's a lot to ask for yeah. for anyone, let alone a young player who's inexperienced and might be burning energy, right. nervous energy with with what's on tap. He showed us in Madrid this year that he could back it up physical matches when he yeah. beat Nadal, Djokovic, and, and Zverev three yeah. in a row in some pretty physical encounters in the quarters and the semis and ran away in the final. We thought he'd be yeah. tired, and he wasn't. He was fresh. So he's got the reserves. He's He's, got, he's done, done the work. And it all came together for him in New York. So you're one of the few people on earth that I could ask this question to, but you got to number one at 21 years old, I think. Mm-hmm. Alcaraz is 19. How did it change for you? Yours was, I guess, February. His was later in the year. Yeah. But how did it change your life? One thing, like the outside stuff, but also your role on tour, having that target, like walking into the locker room, I'm the guy now. Yeah, I mean, there. I, I wouldn't say there's a huge uh, difference between one and four as far as having a target. Everyone mm-hmm. in that kind of class of the rankings is going to have a target on their back every match they play is a chance for someone to make a name for themselves if they haven't already so that you have to be ready for someone to bring their best every time Mm -hmm. but on the flip side you're also carrying the confidence of all the matches you've won that got you there and you know that if you hold the line and play sort of normal tennis someone's gonna have to do something special to beat you but it happens Um, the one thing that I would say I I think is different for Alcaraz than it was for me I didn't ever expect to get to number one. I certainly worked for it and I got there and I earned it and and I loved being there for the period of time that I was able to hang on to it. Alcaraz is one of those players who has been groomed for it and has had Mm -hmm. the the ability that just passes the eye test of this guy's likely to get to number one at some point. And he had a team from the age of 15 that he's been working with that has been building him up for these moments. And I'm sure they've come sooner than they all expected. But getting there, I don't think, was an unexpected outcome for them. And I yeah. think that will probably serve them very well as they you know, move through a new landscape off the court. He was, so you're saying, and I agree, he was like first in his generation from the time he was a kid. Like he's been groomed for this because he was the top of the class and we expected this. I, I'm... Um, I marvel at a lot of things with him, but the maturity and just the workmanlike approach, very Rafa-like, very big three-like that he just approaches it the same way. But again, props to him. Uh, it's been an interesting year. And I do want to mention when we wrap this up, 
I love seeing Nick Kyrgios playing doubles out there and, and yeah. staying in the fight. I know this the Wimbledon points were wacky. It would have been nice to see him get those and the deserved run, but he says he's serious about coming for 2023 Australian Open, and I mean, it would be something if he made a run at his home slam. I'd just love to see him back in the mix more than anything. Yeah, what's exciting for, for Nick is that he's engaged in playing a lot of events here between now and the Australian Open. He's, he's signed up to play some, some team tennis in the Middle East. I think he's playing some exhibitions as well, so he, he's ramping up, which is good news because you don't know what he's doing if he's at home as he's just yeah. playing basketball, as, <laughs> yeah. as he said in the past. What exactly is he getting up to? But if you're out getting matches, then yeah. you're you're getting sharp and you're getting ready and you're pushing in the right direction. It would be big in Australia if he made a run. There's no doubt. Wrapping up with Jim Courier here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Always a pleasure to talk to a TC Titan here. Uh, last thing I really have for you is the Labor Cup. You were gifted the you know the opportunity of a lifetime for a lot of people. Talk to Roger after his last match and. I love the the reaction that you gave the you know regrouping and and saying that I had to be the one to keep it together. It was such an emotional moment, yep. and I guess my first thing is when did you realize this was bigger than just the not even the typical retirement interview, but just an interview with the legend. It seemed like the moment got to everybody, and yeah. thought you handled it gracefully. But if you could just talk about what that moment was like. Well, when Roger announced that Labor Cup was going to be his last. Uh, his last event, I knew that it was likely that, that the Tennis Australia people who hire the, the team on the ground that I work for at Labor Cup, that they were going to want me to do that interview. And so I was ready for it. I knew it was going to be significant. And I anticipated a lot of emotion from Roger. What I didn't anticipate was the emotion from everyone else on the court. Mm. I certainly expected the crowd to be emotional when Roger got emotional, because he is emotional. Mm -hmm. We've seen him cry when he wins, when he loses. You know, he's, he gives it, and yeah. which is great. And he is such a significant um, sporting icon that, that you knew there was going to be an outpouring of emotion for him in, in the room. What was unforeseen was you know, the emotion coming from his peer group, especially the Rafa, Novak, Andy, core group there. Rafa was especially emotional. Yeah. And um, that was really um, kind of an amazing energy. And yeah. it was, uh, you know, it was something that I certainly, I, I, I can appreciate that they were seeing sort of their end in his end in a right. way, like it's kind of foretelling also. Yeah. So it was, um, it was a real honor to be out there and Roger was and is amazing at those interviews. He set the standard for so many things, including on court interviews and he delivered. Yeah. And I know Paul Anacone told me that Taylor Fritz mentioned, like, I didn't expect it to be that emotional. Like the young guys seeing it was good too. Yeah. Like, you might think your career is going to last forever, and you know yeah. it's it's good to see that perspective. He was always great those interviews, and you did a great job in all the Australia ones. The one that stands out to me is that Millman comeback, the last run, where oh, yeah. you're just like, okay, let's <laughs> lot to recap. Let's see what happens there. But no, it was great to see you did a phenomenal job Thanks, there, uh, Jim. This has been a blast. The, the very last thing I do have is when you got to number one or right before you got to number one in 1992, was it a bigger thrill to win the grand slam or to go on Johnny Carson? Oh, Johnny Carson <laughs> was a huge, uh, I was a huge Carson fan of, of the tonight show and he loved tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, like I love his show. So for me to be able to, to get to sit on that couch was a real thrill. I, that's a pick em. That's a yeah, tough one. Tough one. Uh, no, Carson was incredible. You did the golf swing after one of the majors. Yeah, after He's there. Roland Garros. That's he, right. He was front row. He's, I mean, you're right. He was a diehard tennis fan. It was great. But no, yeah, anytime we get the crossover, it's great. I'll have to dig up the tapes. There's no video. It was a long time ago, but yeah. Oh, yeah. we'll try to find it. Yeah, uh, Jim Courier, always thanks, a blast Mitch. chatting with you and listening to you call matches. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. We'll have to do it again soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.